Check one, check one, check one, check one. Uh, check one. Uh, I'm just playing with this. All right. My grandfather used to live in uh, on Venice Beach in a little weird condo in housing made by apartments made especially for Polish immigrants. And he had a mannequin torso of a woman, all breasts bare as mannequins are if they're undressed with makeup. And every time he would kiss me, he'd kiss me on the cheek and also bite me. <laughs> I didn't like that, and I didn't write about it. <laughs> when I was young, steamships would clutter our front porch up to the doorstep, washed to the house, like so much driftwood. The captains Dizzy as fallen leaves would yell to me, asking for directions. My elbows draped over the windowsill of my bedroom upstairs. Not all of them asked. Some found their own way. The sea was far from where we lived. Our porch collected the daggers of prostitutes which had run off into the night, witless of their owners scampering down the gutter, washing to our doorstep. Murder was a wildfire. The duels were performed with intimacy in sweaty alleys of stone pavers and wrought iron. Ladies or gentlemen, it did not matter. Their lives were expendable but never their honor. Stilettos and facones, scissors and cone points. The weapons fled when they could out of disgust for their use. Blood lived in pools and never dried in some places. The prostitutes kept money, uh, kept company beneath a cone of oily streetlight descending from a single lamp on the corner, quietly buzzing in the darkness, fixed to a leaning wooden pole, a pit stop at the edge of town, ready for orgasm or death, any kind of titillation. Every night, our streets rang with howling ghosts. Once, a family had to leave their house because it had become so infested they could no longer survive. It began with cups that wouldn't stay on the counter and cabinets spitting open, but it grew to flooding bathrooms, wardrobes hurled onto the beds, window panes shattering, and then, sobbing in the walls. The activity did not subside. Once the family left, the obnoxious spirits stayed on and had their way with the place. They tore bricks from the walls, planks from the floor, boards from the ceiling, and would hurl them across the interior of the house. People would collect and watch from the street, that's how impressive it was. The ghosts pumped energy into the light bulbs, intermittently making the windows glow and the rooms swirl as debris flew, a cataclysm of breaking glass. Magistrates and pilots and constables swam to our porch, floating down the street only to get caught in our hedges and roll up the walkway. So much fallout, so many stories, no discussions, only shouts of statistics and systems for a society that was controlled by people and not words, by words alone and not the people. The people versus the bombs with policy, without policy, with an iron fist, with a leather glove, with an open hand, with the children dead, with the children educated. Hospitals for everyone, hospitals for no one. Hospitals for some people. Cities in the sky with the walls up. Cities on the earth with the walls down. 
The flotsam was endless. Anything came to our front yard. My brain was a life raft. I barely clung to the side of an abysmal pool. For stability, I knit the hides of panthers together with jackals to make fiercer monsters like lean, black, silent killers with long fangs and eyeballs that glowed red in the dark, deep in the rose bush, jungle vines. Nana? Our neighbor across the street would occasionally, and maybe accidentally, leave her dog poop in a paper bag on our porch. <laughs> it arrived as anything else did in those days, as did Lala, her dog. She came scampering up to the porch, tongue out, waiting, waiting to be, wanting to be pet kicking past the eyeballs and knives and steamships innocently enough, for she had no idea where her poops might have ended up, or what kind of a place it was, or how they got there. Nana's laugh sounded much like her dog's bark, and her, dark, her dog barked often, and Nana loved to laugh. Sometimes Nana would see something funny on television and start laughing, which would make Lala, her tiny dog, a bit nervous. And so she would bark and bark. And when she barked, Lala would often make backward sneezes. She couldn't help it. Nana explained this to me one morning on the sidewalk. She told me it was the cutest thing. Nana thought her dog sneezing was the funniest sound ever. So, if Nana should start laughing for any reason and cause Lala to bark at her laughing, with Lala's strains of barking and backward sneezing bringing on uncontrollable peals of laughter from Nana, who would snore to catch her breath, which was, which would in turn alarm the poor dog, they would go on like that hour after hour until Nana was sore and there was a commercial on and Lala would curl up on her pillow to sleep it off, and Nana would leave the couch to change her underwear. I caught her once on her way over with a paper bag in her hand. I went downstairs. I went downstairs to tell Papa. He was sitting at the dining table in the late afternoon on a Saturday. Pop! Nana's on her way with more poop. No, she stopped. He didn't even raise his head. He was peering deep into the wooden surface of the table through his glasses. They were thick and thumb smudged with gold rims. Come here, boy. You got a bugger. Dad, that's just my nose. No, it's not. Come here. Let me have a look at that. But Nana, never mind her. He took me by the back of the head and pushed his finger into my nostril. I could feel the ridges of his skin. Papa's fingers smelled like garlic and soil. I don't get it. What are you doing in your spare time, boy? I didn't answer. He wasn't really asking. You saw a loop the alpha in the thing in some rush, yes. Yeah. Uh, so that brings us to another conclusion. Can we have another round of applause for all the amazing readers? Thank you. Thank you so much. And, uh, and for Jack, who worked so hard to make this happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, thanks to Cafe de Soleil and, and Mustafa. And, yeah, this is a uh, thank you so much. We're, we're, we think we're going to be back here next month. The theme is um, Whimsical Apocalypse. And you have until a week from Monday to get in your submissions. And Deborah K. Steinberg of Conspiracy of Venus is going to be singing songs. I mean, how amazing is this going to be? Thursday, September 25th, 7 p.m. Here, come and buy a book. $5, a couple left. And have a great night. Thank you.